Amen. God bless you. you. May be seated. Praise God. Thank the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Okay, so thanks again to uh, Jody and uh, Eric for last week for stepping up and uh, standing in for Mike and Suzanne. They did a great job. They got everything accomplished and with a, a little bit of uh, uh, direction from... Uh, Praise the Lord. Anyway, uh, I don't know what's the deal here, but it's not, it's not lighting up. So. Praise God, everybody. Praise the Lord. Okay, praise the Lord again. Lord. We're still at it here. Praise God. And so thanks again, uh, Tim. Great job as always. Suzanne and Peter, good to see you again. I know he's been swamped with stuff at work, but right, it's great. this week at least. Yeah, praise the Lord. I appreciate uh... I have to work later on. <laughs> praise God. Thank you, Lord. Suzanne and Peter for leading us in worship and for everybody's testimonies and Prayer requests, it's all good. Praise the Lord. I just think we're living in a time where the Scripture talks about everything that can be shaken will be shaken. And I think part of it is a separation of believers from religion as much as it is from everything else. I'm not saying people that are, that are religious aren't going to heaven. I'm just saying they're not cooperating with what God's trying to do today, here and now. And so I think that's part of the situation we're confronted with. God isn't doing this stuff, but He's using it to make clear those who are, as Tim says, on the Lord's side and those who are just perpetuating a religious. I, I just have to bring this up because this just is coming to me. I've heard other people talk about it too. With what you're saying, Pastor, there's the five wise and the five foolish virgins. They're, you know, the, that parable. They're all virgins. They're all Christians. But five of them were foolish and didn't get the the oil, the Holy Spirit, right. but the five went away and did get the Holy Spirit. And that's, you know, with these times coming, we have to have the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. We have to be connected to God. Religion's not going to get this and accomplished. Anything we can do to stay in the Holy Spirit, you know, church, not just at church, you know, as, as you say, but at, at home, we, we have to be Jesus to this world. Amen. That's and a fact. We can't, uh, the devil again showed me, well, the devil didn't show me, the devil had showed me a lot of things that aren't true, but the, the Holy Spirit showed me that the devil was just defeated by a man filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what, what, unfortunately, religion teaches us, well, he was the Son of God, mm. so what, we can't compare to that. Exactly. But he wasn't when he was here. He laid that all down. That's right. Yeah. And that's where it's so humiliating for the devil, which is, which is great and awesome. Jesus was fully man. He was the Son of Man. Yes. And he defeated the devil only because he was full of the Holy Spirit. Yes. He was fully man. He, and a uh, full man defeated the devil. And that if he right. did it, we can do it because he went to be with the Father so we can do greater things. That's exactly right. So We have the Word of God. That was Jesus in the flesh. He just simply only said what the Father said. He was a manifestation of that. But he did. You're absolutely right. He operated as a man on this planet. He didn't operate as God. Nope. He gave up all of that yep. in order to be a man and operate strictly and solely by the Holy Spirit yep. and show us what is possible That's for a right. person who's connected to the Lord, who puts their confidence in him and his word. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Amen. Thank the Lord. Good word, Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. I'm, uh, I'm not shaking hands today, and I got a little bit of sniffles, and my head's a little weird, so, I mean, a little weirder than usual. And I'm, I don't have a temperature. I don't have a temperature or anything. It's not COVID. It's just the usual crap that comes around this time of year, and so my nose is running a little bit, and I'm, I took some uh, 
Alka-Seltzer plus something, I don't know what it was, just to stop it from running like a faucet, and that makes me a little weird. <coughs> praise the Lord. So, Anyway, we're a little weirder than normal, praise God. <laughs> you know the difference between a cat and a comma? This is interesting. Well, a cat has its claw at the end of its paws, and a comma has its paws at the end of its claws. Praise the Lord. That's right, yeah. Praise God. That's English 101. Praise God. Amen. But there are a couple of things I'd really like to see. You know, we've got the elections coming and everybody's promising everything and what they're going to do and what we need to have and all that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm, I'd be happy with two things. We need more open minds and fewer open mouths. And grocery carts with four wheels that all point in the same direction. That'd be good, wouldn't it? Praise the Lord. Uh, you know, uh, kids are all into, you know, the supernatural and all that kind of stuff in terms of the uh, little programs that they watch. What's that one with the, uh, the dragon slayer or whatever? But anyway, anybody know where dragon milk comes from? Really short cows. Lord. This is a definition of a neurotic. Somebody who worries about things that didn't happen in the past instead of worrying about things that won't happen in the future. <laughs> praise God. That's the world we live in. Hallelujah. Okay, praise God. Like I said, I think uh, we're living in a time when uh, God is separating uh, not only uh, the believers from the unbelievers, but also the believers from the religious people who are they believe in God, but they don't operate in the totality of what God has for us. And therefore, they can't really have an impact on the people around them other than to make them feel guilty or ashamed or whatever. And there's plenty of that already. So I think partly what ha what's happening here is God's fine-tuning the church. He's bringing it to a place where it can function, as Peter said, as Jesus in this world. And in order to do that, we have to be as free of sin consciousness as Jesus was. He was never uh, timid about healing or, or declaring or speaking the word or doing the things that God would do. Why? Because he never felt inferior. He never felt like he couldn't do it. He felt like it was God was going to do this through him if he believed. And that's the way we're supposed to be operating today. So with that in mind, let me just let's look at a few scriptures here. I've talked about some of these things before, and it's, it's kind of a, an extension of what I was uh, teaching last week. But I think it's, it's critically important today, more than it has ever been before, for the very reason that we're talking about. That this, the church, the body of Christ, has to rise up. It has to begin to function the way it was intended to function from day one. It has to be Christ. It has to be God in the world. It has to be God in human beings functioning as only God can. Amen? So let's look at this in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And we'll read verses 9 through 13. 2 Corinthians 3, 9 through 13. For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more does the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect, by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. We're obviously talking about the difference between the law and, and grace. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look at the end of that which is abolished. So in other words, he's showing them by gradually he, his... the. Uh, the glow or whatever it was that was on his face from being in the presence of the Lord would fade away. And that was re referring to the law will, re will, will fade away. They didn't, when they would look at him, it, 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 it frightened them to see that glow, but it also bothered him to see it disappear. Right? Because they, I suppose they felt like, well, he's not as in tune with God as he was when he was all lit up. Right? So 
He's saying, what he's saying here is that the children could not steadfastly look at the end of that which was abolished. So they couldn't see that fade away. They couldn't see it go away, right? Because he had the veil over over himself. Well, it's the same thing that happened when the law was done away with. They couldn't see it. They were too focused on the law or on the moment to see that God was doing away with that and there was something better to come. There was something more important that God was trying to reveal to them, okay? Colossians chapter 1 Verses 21 and 22. Colossians 1, 1 and 22. Welcome everybody that's online. Sorry if I uh, didn't mention it before. We know you're out there. I can hear you breathing. Praise the Lord. No, I'm just, we're, we're, we appreciate you being part of the service and being with us this morning. and Praying that God is blessing you as he is us in Jesus' name. So. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works... Yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. That's pretty crazy, isn't it? You that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind, sin consciousness that we've had ever since Adam fell, right? Were enemies, wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled or made right with in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. When you accept Christ, that's your reality. That becomes your reality. And he presents us before God in that reality. Right? All right, look at one more scripture, Jude uh, 24, verse 24. Now unto him that is able to keep you, Now, he presents us, right, perfect, you know, perfect. But not only does he present us that way, he keeps us. He's able to keep us that way from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Now, what the glory of Jesus is the Father. I mean, Jesus is the manifestation of the Father, right? And he gives glory to God. He reveals glory to God or reveals the glory of God in a human being. And so he's able to keep us from falling and present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. So he presents us before God himself in heaven, right? Now he's back, right, where he originated. And now he presents us this way before God, right? So through Christ, through his death, not our death, not his second coming, not, not the return of Jesus, but through his death, we are holy, unblameable, unreprovable in the Father's sight or in the eyes of God. Yes. Amen. So that's righteousness. And that righteousness is the key to inheriting the world and receiving the glory of God. Yes. He makes it all possible, right? Look at Romans chapter 3, uh, verses 22 through 24. Romans three twenty-two through 24. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. So we're aware of the sin problem. I mean, we all know. We deal with it, right? And coming short of the glory. But we need to know that Jesus makes us and keeps us faultless, and presents us to the presence of God, amen, to the presence, not just of God, but to the presence of God's glory, the scripture says, with exceeding great joy. Praise the Lord. Some, some people teach, and this is, this is the religious aspect of this, that that happens, we get presented to God after our death, or after Jesus' return, or second coming. But that's not what the Bible is teaching. It says the moment you were born again, you were presented before God, perfect, righteous, unreprovable, unblameable, right? Look at Ephesians here quickly. Ephesians 5, 26 and 27. Ephesians 5, 26 and 27. Praise the Lord. 
that he might sanctify and cleanse it. He's speaking of the church, the body of Christ. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself. Now there, there goes what we just were talking about. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Praise the Lord. But we are in God's presence. Right? I'll never leave you or forsake you. We are, we've been in His presence from the moment we were born again. Amen? Right now. We are presented to Christ, the glorious church, now. That isn't something God's working on and trying to get it fixed up. There is a church that is glorious, that has been presented to God, amen, to Jesus, and has been accepted as perfect, righteous, holy, without blemish. That's us today. And it would have to be, because look at Hebrews 4.16. The church, the religious world is still saying that's what Jesus is going to do someday. When he kind of gets us all cleaned up and straightened out and fixed up, then he'll present it. No, we, we've been presented. We have been in his presence from the moment we were born again. And we, were in his, and we could not be in his presence if we weren't perfect. So let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Well, this is where, that's where we are today. That's the place where we're at right now. Amen? How can we come boldly to the heavenly throne? And that's what he's talking about here. He's not talking about the temple. Right? He's talking about the heavenly temple from which everything here was made from, or the, 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 the original that everything here was made as a result of. Amen? So how are we to come boldly to this heavenly throne of grace, unless we are already glorious. Amen? Unless we're already holy, unless we're already unblameable, unless we're already unreprovable, without spot and wrinkle, right? And so then, faultless in His presence. Now, just think about this. Under the Old Covenant, now we know all of this was given for our admonition or for our instruction. Teaching, so we know how to operate, how, how to function, right? Well, under the Old Covenant, which is what's pointing us to the reality or to the truth, right? All the temple stuff, there's a temple in heaven, there, but it's the real thing. It's the real deal. And what was here is a physical thing that was built by Moses after the instructions or the blueprint that God gave him. Don't mess with this. Don't change anything because it has to reflect the truth of, of, of the heavenly tabernacle, right? And so if you remember, Jesus said, don't touch me, Mary. But, you know, after he was resurrected, I must go to my father. Why? He had to take the blood of that sacrifice to the real altar and sprinkle the mercy seat. So the real deal, not just the physical stuff that had been going on here to point to that, but he was doing what all of that had pointed to, right? So how in the world... Under the Old Covenant, men who entered the earthly Holy of Holies, not the heavenly one, but the natural one, they died because of their uncleanness. Leviticus, look at this in Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. It's just, a, just one example. But that high priest who went in, he had to be totally cleansed. He had to be sprinkled with blood. He had to have the sacrifices and everything for him so that he could go in. If there was anything irregular about him, they'd tie a rope around his leg so that when he went in there, if there was sin in him or un, uh, uh, a sacrifice hadn't been made for whatever that issue was, he dropped dead right there in the place and they would have to pull him out and start over again. So Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, these are priests. They're in the Aaronic priesthood. They're sons of Aaron. So the Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them, his censer, and put fire therein, and put incense thereon, and offered strange fire before the Lord. They went into the presence of the Lord with strange fire. They hadn't been told to do it. There hadn't been sacrifices to set this up. They just did it. Amen. The God hadn't commanded them. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. These aren't bad people. They're priests. They just weren't operating under the system. They just went in on their own. And because of their uncleanness, they could not be in the presence of God. They died. It wasn't like God had to kill them. They just died because they were in the presence of perfection. Yeah. And they were imperfect, right? So unholy 
and unclean men died in the earthly tabernacle, which is just a figure or a type of the true tabernacle in heaven. All right? So we're born again believers. And we enter boldly into the heavenly tabernacle. That's what Jesus is telling us to do. Come boldly to the throne of grace. He's not talking about a temple. The temple doesn't exist. He's talking about the real, true temple. The one in heaven. Amen? The heavenly tabernacle. And he tells us to do it without any fear of being consumed or being punished or corrected or killed. Amen? Because we've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. Holy, unblameable, unreprovable, and faultless by his sacrifice. That's what he's trying to get us to understand. You can come boldly to the throne of grace because your sins have all been dealt with. You are as righteous, amen, as God is because he has given you his righteousness. Praise the Lord. He, look at Hebrews 10, uh, verses 19 and 20. And I mean, I think, you know, it's, this, is, this isn't just a pass. It isn't just to make us feel good that we're not going to be punished. This is about telling us you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. God has accepted you as perfect and he wants to use you, but you've got to know that your perfection has been accepted by God or you're going to be going, running around with a guilty conscience all the time and never feeling like you're capable of doing what God wants you to do because you haven't measured up. And he's telling you that's all been dealt with. You have the ability to do exactly what Jesus did, just what Peter was talking about in the beginning, right? So having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Now think about it. We are kings and priests, he tells us. So we, we minister to God. That's what the priests were doing. They, they would take the sacrifices and they would go in and sprinkle and do the incense and the whole thing. They were ministering to God. That's why they had to be cleansed and, and purified through the sacrifices and so forth. Well, by one sacrifice, we have been made perfect. We can now minister to God. We can now come boldly to the throne of grace. We don't have to back in. We don't have to have a rope tied around our leg. We can just walk right straight into God as if he were our heavenly father, which he is, Abba. Right? So we can minister by the same means that the priests under the Old Covenant did, only we can do it directly to God without any kind of fear of correction or punishment or, or, or pain or suffering, amen, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. When that veil was rent, it was simply, again, a symbol, symbolic thing that took place representing the, 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 the rending of Jesus' flesh. Or the thing that was between Jesus and God, his body. The same thing that's between us and God. But he has sanctified us and made us unreprovable, unblameable, perfect and righteous in his sight so that we can come boldly. Even in this body, we can come boldly before the throne of grace. Amen. And think about this. That's the only, it's the absolutely only way to enter the holiest. The only way to do that is to match the holiness. Right. I mean, God, that's what God told us. You've got to be as righteous as I am to get into my presence. You've got to be as holy as the holiest place is in order for you to enter it without being destroyed. Amen. To enter inferior to its holiness would be to invite death. Amen. To match it in holiness is only accomplished by the blood of Jesus. Animal blood that atoned or covered the sins of the people, it was sufficient to enter the pattern or the type of the true tabernacle, but to enter the heavenly holiest of all takes the blood of Jesus. Bulls and goats won't do it. Yes. Amen. Hebrews 9, 19 through 24. When, for when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of my covenant, or the, uh, the blood of the covenant. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of these things in the heavens, now get this, he's, he's telling us there's a real deal going on. This is a pattern. But for when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water, scarlet wool and hyssop, Sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle 
and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Bulls and goats won't work in heaven. Amen. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figure of the true, but in the he into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Amen. Praise the Lord. So Adam's sin contaminated everything. Think about the, the authority that God gave Adam. When he sinned, he contaminated everything from earth all the way to heaven and heaven with the exception of the throne of God. Because it couldn't come to him. Right? But his sin contaminated everything else. That's the kind of authority that he had that God had given him. So everything from earth to heaven excluding the throne of God. And that tells us the kind of authority that Adam had been given, amen, when he ruled the works of God's hands. Because that's where we are. Now look at uh, Psalms 8, 4, and 6. He's given to man to rule the works of his hands. Isn't that what Jesus did when he was here? He healed the sick. He went about doing good. You know, he did what God would do if it had been God. Right? What is man that thou art mindful of him, the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and crowned him with glory and honor. Thou hast madest him to have dominion over the work of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. <laughs> all things. Everything but God himself yes. is what he's done. I mean, this is amazing. But Christ's blood sanctified those heavenly things. Amen? And it's by the same blood that we enter the same way. Through His blood, we are placed... Now listen to this. Through His blood, we're placed on an equal basis with heaven. And that's why we're not consumed. Nothing else has to change for us to go to heaven other than to dump this physical body because the truth is we are already there in Christ Second Corinthians uh, 5 17 and 18 and all this time I mean it's so crazy because all the time religion is telling us how far we have fallen short of the glory of God when in truth when we got born again we have matched the glory we didn't do it. God did that for us. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To do exactly what God does. Right? He's telling us that's what we, we've been given this ability to do this. So if the old things are passed away, why, do, why are we still fighting them? Why are we still struggling with sin consciousness? Why are we still battling with behaviors? Because that's what religion teaches us. That isn't what God teaches. That's what religion teaches. The reason we're still fighting those things is because we have yet to behold we have yet to see that all things have become new, including ourselves. Praise the Lord. And the result is, we don't get to enjoy the new things. We're still dealing with old things that have been done away with, but because they keep getting thrown back to us because of religion and that way of thinking, we don't ever enjoy the new things. And the new things are... We are the righteousness of God in Christ. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. There is, no, there is no lack for our God supplies all of our need according to his riches and glory and on and on and on. We spend all of our time trying to deal with the old things that God through Christ has already dealt with. That's called religion. Look at Luke 9.23. I'm going to just use a, a few examples here. And I've, done the, I've, said, I've talked about these before. But just, just to give you an idea of how we misinterpret 
because we're not looking at things through spiritual eyes, we're looking at through natural eyes. So we're getting natural results instead of the spiritual results that we're looking for. But he said, Jesus, he says, he said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. How many of you have heard? You need to take up your cross and follow Jesus. Well, let me just remind you of something here. Jesus hadn't gone to the cross yet when he said this. Right? He had not been to the cross. He had not uh, been crucified. And we're saying, you know, you need to die daily. You need to take up your cross. You need to do this. And the, that isn't even the context in which Jesus was speaking here. Look, uh, Hebrews uh, 12 and verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So, okay, when he said that, he hadn't gone to the cross yet. Now he has been to the cross, right? But he's not on the cross. He's seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. Praise the Lord. So to tell believers who've already been crucified with Christ... Right? So to tell them that have been crucified with Christ to take up the cross and follow Jesus is a contradiction because Jesus is no longer going to the cross. He, once and for all. Look, I'm just going to give you four real quick scriptures here just to validate this and drive it home. But Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. That's the thing about, you know, the crosses, and we see them all the time with Jesus is on the cross, and I get it. I'm, I, I'm not trying to be nitpicking here, but the truth is he's not on that cross. If it, we shouldn't be making that the focus. He's, that, that's history. That's gone. That's done. That's over with. Amen? I am crucified with Christ. This is Paul speaking, but he's talking about believers in general. So I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now if I'm to take up my cross now, what's that saying about what Jesus did? It's saying it wasn't enough that I, I can add something to this? I don't have a cross to take up. I've, I've already been taken off the cross. I've been buried with him. I've been raised again in newness of life, right? I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Romans 6, uh, verses 6 through 11. Romans 6, 6 through 11. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin or be subject to sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Praise the Lord. That doesn't mean we don't still do stupid stuff, but it just means we're freed from the consequences. We're freed from that being applied or, or put against our account. Right? Knowing this, our old man has been crucified. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, now if you believe that you were crucified with Christ, then we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death has no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, I mean, he's alive now, he's God. He liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Reconnected to God. Yes. Praise the Lord. Romans 6 and 4. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. What is the newness of life? That we are new creatures, that we're no longer sinners, we're no longer held accountable, we're no longer uh, have a sin consciousness. We're innocent. Praise the Lord. Uh, last one here for this, Col Colossians 2, uh, verses 12 and 13. Colossians 2, verses 12 and 13. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. 
And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Praise the Lord. We're on equal footing with Jesus. And Jesus is Lord. Yes. <laughs> now you can understand how when Jesus talked this way, because that's all I'm doing is I'm talking the way he talked when he was here. He was considered a blasphemer. Why? Because religion says to make yourself equal with God, you are to be killed. You should be stoned. You should be burned at the stake or something. I'm not doing that. I'm not making myself equal. And that's what Jesus said. I'm not. Isn't this what the word says? Isn't it what God has spoken? You know, but religion is so, so sin conscious and it preaches it week after week after week after week. And it's a wonder anybody has any liberty or freedom in God at all. Religion teaches us to be cross bearers when we should have recognized we are throne sitters. We are seated with him in heavenly places. And yet we're thinking, I'm going to the cross again today. I mean, I'm going to have to take up my cross and I'm going to be, there's going to be a lot of pain and suffering. And no, I'm, I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ. Guess what? There is no sickness there. There's no disease there. There's no poverty there. There's no hatred there. There's no war. There's, it's just God's perfection. You can't, you can't fully receive the glory of God or the manifest word of God, or the demonstrated spirit of God or the power of God or the overflow of prosperity because we've been told by religion to die to self and take up the cross instead of walking in newness of life. Instead of walking in the inheritance, we're, walk, we're struggling to get accepted. So maybe we'll get a little something that falls off the, the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Right? Or maybe I'll just come back and be a servant. And see, everything that's in the Word of God, Tim talks about it frequently, about the prodigal son, is God saying, come, you're, you're equal, you're my child, you're my son. Yeah, I can't, I'm not going to make you a servant, you're not a servant. And the older brother, religion. He's not happy that his brother's been redeemed. He's not happy that his brother's still alive. He's not happy that his brother's part of the family. He's mad as hell because he isn't doing everything he had to do. And then he tells, to, he goes to God and he says, Hey, where was the fatted calf for me? I've been out here working in the fields all along. You never gave me a fatted calf. And God said, Kid, listen. Everything I have is yours. You could have had it any time you wanted it. You just had to believe in my goodness to give it. It was yours. We're begging God for things that God is saying, I don't understand what you're asking for. I have given you all things that pertain to life and godliness. You can have the fatted calf any day you want. You can have it every day if you want. There is no limit to what God wants us to experience in him. Praise the Lord. To experience and to, to see the manifestation of the glory of God, we have to see ourselves where we really are in Christ, at the right hand of God, not on the cross. God has made us his force, his power. The right hand of God means the, the, the position of power and authority. And that's where we're seated. And God has given us his power and his authority not just up to heaven, but including the, the holiest of holies. His very position has been given to us to demonstrate in the earth. Man, if that don't make you excited, I, I'm telling you, this takes a revelation. Because our puny human minds just cannot get around the vastness and the authority and the power and the goodness of God that he has delegated to us. Because of the religious way of thinking, it, we always fall back to the, to the position of, I'm not worthy. I can't do this. I, I, I'm a hypocrite. No, you're just confused. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. You are God in the earth, in a human being. Praise the Lord. The misconception this idea of dying daily 
it comes from a misunderstanding of two New Testament scriptures. And believe me, I've, I've looked through this stuff because I'm looking. <laughs> I, I, I've been there. I've, I've had the guilt. I've had to preach to me and, and preach to myself and, and feel like, I don't know how we're ever going to do any of these things, you know, unless we just get hyped up enough, we get ourselves excited enough, or we get the right individual to come through here that somehow has, you know, moved beyond us. The first, the first one of those scriptures is 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 31. And we've all heard it preached, I'm sure. <clears throat> I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. Paul, he died daily. Well, if Paul died daily, you need to be dying daily because you, you're, you're obviously more screwed up than Paul was. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Yeah, he had some issues, but he died daily. And I don't see how this misunderstanding came about. If we just read it in the context, it's pretty obvious. Look, let's just back up to 1 Corinthians 15 and read verses 28 through 30. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead, if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? Praise the Lord. Paul's talking about if the dead rise not. He's talking about resurrection. He's talking about physical death and then resurrection. Amen? The jeopardy every hour that he speaks of here is from uh, verse 32. Battling the beasts, you know, if the, after the manner of men, I have fought with beasts at Ephesus. What advantage it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. So here's, here's what Paul's saying. Fight, he's fighting the beast is about fighting uh, the beast and the constant threat of death by the Roman Empire, by the Jewish religion, by the Jewish teachers and, 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 and uh, authorities. That's what he means by I die daily. He's not talking about something he's doing, you know, to die to himself. He's saying, I'm dying every day. I got the whole Roman Empire after me. I got the whole Jewish uh, religion after me. I've got the beast of just being out in the world and having to deal with things to get to other people and try to help them and so forth. I'm dying daily. Not, not the misconception of dying to self. It's, and, and that's what he's trying to get us to understand. He's not talking about dying to himself. He's dying... Because he's, be, he's being killed every day by these things that are trying to get him, trying to destroy him. Amen? So look at Romans 8 and verse 36. This is the second misunderstanding of dying to self. Romans 8, 36. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Now he's using the same kind of metaphor, the same context in the way that he's speaking about dying, right? So he's talking about... For your sake, we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. He's talking to the church, one of the churches that he's dealing with in Rome. So it doesn't say we are sheep to the slaughter. It says that the world thinks we are sheep to the slaughter. That's how they see us. Amen? And again, I don't get the misunderstanding here to, uh, of, of thinking this is dying to self. Because the next verse, Romans 8.37 says, in fact, it shouts it. No, right? Nay, no. In all these things, we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. So he's not talking about us dying to ourselves. He's talking about being overwhelmed and overcome by the world and the, and the conditions of religion and, and governments and so on and so forth. He said, we're like sheep to the slaughter. Well, we see what's happening to Christians all around the world. And it's, we're seeing more and more of it right here in the United States, little by little. They just take a little and take a little bit more and a little bit more. Just this whole idea of not being able to have church services and all that. Government shouldn't even be involved in that. That ought to be up to the individual. I get the idea of not wanting to spread the virus and everything else, but there are far worse things uh, than having the virus. And, they, and all those things, all that stuff, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Praise the Lord. Amen. We are more than conquerors. Yes. He says, crucifying the flesh. Now, here's another thing. Crucifying the flesh. 
Now, that's, this is a favorite one, uh, uh, those who are sin conscious and wanting to keep everybody else in that same condition. Galatians 5, uh, 24, and it's easily disproved as well. Galatians 5, verse 24. Praise the Lord, and I'm about done here. Praise God. And they that are Christ have, past tense, they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. How? We were crucified with Christ. It's a done deal. We're not doing it. There's nothing more you can do. If it wasn't done through your relationship with Jesus, it ain't getting done. It's not going to happen. Praise the Lord. We will not reign as kings and priests. Amen. We're not going to reign as kings. We're not going to serve as priests as long as we allow religion and faulty theology to keep us in sin consciousness. Amen. That's, the sin consciousness is what Jesus declared we've been cleansed of. That's why I say religion, and this sounds horrible, but look, the devil is more involved in religion than anything. Why? Because if you're out doing bad stuff, you know, I mean, if you're out there getting drunk and getting high and running with, you know, bad crowd, and, you know, prostitutes, all that other kind of stuff. Look, you're not, cons you're not thinking about a, a guilty conscience. You're thinking about a good time. Your definition of that good time. It's us who have turned from some of that. You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying we don't maybe have a beer or have a glass of wine. I'm, I'm not even going there. That's the word, this isn't what we're talking about here. We're talking about sin or unbelief. Praise the Lord. And so it, how are we ever going to reign as kings and minister as priests? Because he tells us we are to reconcile as we have been reconciled. Amen. As long as we believe or let religion... And this faulty theology keep us conscious of sin. Keep us totally focused on sin. What we're saying is, you didn't do it enough, Jesus. We're rejecting the one thing that delivers us and makes us possible to be the manifestation of God in this earth. There has to be innocence. Before Adam had sin consciousness... They had authority everywhere. They had authority over the work of God's hands. God shows it by, you name them, Adam. Here they are. I'll create them. You declare them to be whatever they are. And that's what they'll be. He had authority over demonic forces in the, in the heavenlies. He allowed the enemy to come and lie to him. Why? Because he didn't believe what God had already told him. That they were innocent. As long as they kept an innocent mindset... They'd be fine. But if you eat from that knowledge of good and evil, you're going to have sin consciousness immediately, and that's going to deprive you of the ability to be in authority in this earth the way you need to be. It'll stop it. God didn't have to do a thing. Adam did it. God didn't withdraw anything from him. The moment Adam became sin conscious, all of a sudden now God's an enemy. Where before God, he hung out with him every day. Now all of a sudden he's hiding from him. Why? What changed? What changed about God? Nothing. The only thing that changed was Adam's perception of his being acceptable to God. Right? Okay, we'll, we'll close with this, two scriptures. Revelation 1, 5, and 6. And so, it, you know, you can, uh, even saying it, it sounds almost arrogant. You know, I mean, it's almost uncomfortable to say it. But that's how we have to be bold. We've got to be, Jesus, Jesus didn't go about, they said, what, are you perfect? Hey, I'm perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect. From Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Close with this one. 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18. 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18. Praise God. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. We talked about that last week. But we all, with open face, beholding, in other words, without shame, without the veil, without trying to hide who or what we are, as in a glass, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord.
It doesn't get any plainer than that. This is God's decision. This is God's choice. This is what God wants. We're changed into the same image. As we look at who we are in Christ, when we see Jesus and we see how he operated and how he worked, and we see, begin to see ourselves in that, we are changed into that same image, into that same reality. Amen. God sees us as Christ. And I guess he's probably scratching his head from time to time wondering, why are they acting like that? Jesus, that don't look like the way you behave. You know what I'm saying? Jesus is there. He's God again. He's, he is operating as God. And he's saying, look, I came down there to give you equality with me again. How do you get equality with God? By being innocent. Praise the Lord. He's made us innocent. He wants fellowship. He, he wants us to come boldly to the throne of grace. Because when we do that, you know, Tim was talking about so many people turn away and go back. Why? Why do they do that? Because they feel guilty and shamed because of their failure. And we all know that we fail. But not in the eyes of God. In God's eyes, we have been perfected. And we keep going back and eating from the wrong tree and wondering why we're running around exposed. All of our stupidity is exposed to us. Adam knew that he was naked. Nobody else knew it. He was the only one there, him and Eve. Right? But it bears, it, it, it exposes our flesh, our, our natural man. And Jesus is saying, that's not who you really are. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. And you can do all things through him who has perfected you. Amen. And that's where we have to come to. Our children need to know this. Our grandchildren. Listen, they're living in a world where if they hear anything about Jesus at all, it's about his punishment or it's about his judgment or it's about this condemnation. And they feel like, well, you know, they're, they're human. So they know they're flawed. And it just makes it that much harder for them to come boldly and receive the things that they need, the healings, the deliverance, the mental physical, especially in this time, church, I'm telling you, it's going to get crazier than it is already. And we already are feeling the pressure. We know. We get up and we're feeling like, man, I just want to ah, scream, you know, and do something. We need to keep this focus. Yes. I'd turn that idiot box off. I mean, you know, I, I'm not saying we shouldn't be aware of what's going on around us. But when you get up first thing in the morning and you turn on and all you hear, bang, 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 bang. I heard it this morning. And I'm thinking, why? Why are we even listening to this crap? All it does is try to cram us back into that little box of flawed, weak, pitiful humans that don't know how they're going to get through this unless we find some great government leader that's going to take care of all of our problems. I guarantee you they're as flawed as we are, if not more so. And if we're putting our confidence in people we got a big problem. God is our source. He's our supply. He's our Father and our soon coming King. Yes. Praise the Lord. And nothing will be impossible. I'm telling you, if there's a shaking going on, it ain't COVID-19. It ain't the devil. It's God using what the devil meant for evil to bring good to us, to bring us to a place of the full stature of Jesus Christ so that we can live out these last days the way we're supposed to so that we can see the great end time revival that God has intended to be. And we will. Somebody's going to do this. And it might as well be us. That's what God said. You're the generation. Have at it. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Give the Lord a hand this morning. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. 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 God bless all of you. Let's go in the power of His might. Praise the Lord. Act like you are somebody, praise God. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.